You can find the works I've cited and an online handout on the web page that I've pointed you to here. The myth is that we as researchers can rely on a shared understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about intentional action or about mental states like intention, knowledge, surprise, desire, anger, and the rest. This is a myth of mind reading because on any standard view, the most sophisticated forms of ordinary mind reading involve attributing those mental states. So in this talk, I want to argue, first of all, that the myth is untrue. We do not have a shared understanding of those mental states. I want to argue that this is a practical matter. It's an impairment to research in developmental, cognitive and philosophical domains, comparative domains too. And I want to argue that there's something we can do about it. We can work around our lack of a shared understanding of those mental states. But let me start with something which I hope will be familiar to many people here. This is that adults, infants and non-human animals can all track instrumental actions and mental states, or at least there's a large body of evidence that points us in that direction. I think you'll agree. Now by tracking, I mean something specific. I mean that how things unfold in the mind reader non-accidentally depends on the facts about the mental states. So for example, to track Maxi's state of knowledge is for this to be true. At the moment, Maxi knows full well where the chocolate is. But if we change that situation and present you with a scenario where Maxi does not know, manifestly does not know where his chocolate is, you will change your behavior. And that change in your behavior will not be an accident. And that's tracking. And that's all that tracking involves. So the discoveries about tracking invite us to ask two questions. One about processes and one about models. The question about processes is easier to understand, but has been much less studied. The question is which processes are involved in tracking instrumental actions and mental states? Now you'll see later in the talk, Charlotte Grosser Wiesman providing quite a lot of evidence that's relevant to uh, this question. Sorry, not later in this talk, later in the session. Um, I also wanted to highlight that Jason Lowe has included me in some work that his group has done, arguing that among the processes involved in tracking mental states, there does appear to be a role for motor representations, which is an interesting discovery. But what I want to talk about today is this question about models. So a model is just a way that some aspects of the world could be. A model of minds and actions is a way that mental aspects of the world could be. As researchers, we will usually offer some kind of theory or maybe an informal counterpart of a theory in order to specify a model. But the model is a way the world could be and not the theory itself. So the question I want to ask about models is which models are involved in tracking instrumental actions and mental states? And here the idea is this. The model involved in a tracking process is the way the world would have to be for the tracking process to be error free. So if you want to put it in a colorful metaphorical way, you can say that the model captures the world of the mental from the point of view of the mind reader, not how the world really is, but how the world appears to be to the mind reader. What, is, what, is, what would the world have to be like for the various tracking processes to be error free? That's the question. Now in the past, and that's the question for today. Now in the past, I focused on answering this question concerning the most basic forms of mind reading. I think I could see clearly that there was a problem there and that we needed to answer it. But I also made a mistake. And the mistake was to think that in the most sophisticated cases of tracking instrumental actions and mental states, those involving typically human adults are their most reflective. I thought that the question in this case was trivial, right? And that we already knew the answer. After all, as I've already said, most people think, and I suppose this is right, that human adults are their most sophisticated. Their mind reading involves intentional actions and mental states like intention, knowledge, desire, 
anger, surprise, and the rest. So surely we already understand these things, and so we already know. But you know, I think this was a mistake. It was a mistake because we do not have a good shared understanding of these mental states. When you say intention, I'm actually never quite sure whether what you're talking about is whether what I have in mind. And I'm not even sure that we do have much in mind when we talk about intention and the rest. Now, the way to see this question is to ask, what anchors our understanding of these mental states? And when I say what anchors our understanding, I mean, for us as researchers, you and me who are engaged in the project of research, as opposed to people going about their ordinary lives when we're doing that. The first option would be to say, look, well, as it happens, I'm a pretty expert mind reader. And I suppose you might well be the same too, although some of my family members will sometimes criticize my mind reading skills. Of course they will. Um, but I feel like, you know, I'm, I've got some ability anyway. So I might rely on my own personal expertise in order to anchor my understanding as a researcher. And you might do the same. And I think you only have to mention this as an option to see that it can't be right. One of the problems is that there's a certain amount of diversity. So you and I, for example, may have different cognitive styles, different cognitive styles. We may be at different points on the autistic spectrum, or we may differ in other ways that affect our mind reading expertise. And that may mean that if we try to anchor our ordinary under our understanding as researchers in our personal expertise, we may find that we're using different anchors that produce significantly different takes on what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about knowledge, intention, and the rest. Another possibility, of course, is that you live in, on an island in the Pacific Ocean, whereas I live in Japan or the UK. And in those cases as well, there may be significant differences between us. But I don't think that's the most important problem here. I think there's an even deeper problem, which Fisk captures thinking about intention when he talks about the lexical fallacy in emotion research. So what he means is the fallacy of supposing that because you and I have a word for anger, in the language that we're both using now, it follows that you and I have a concept and that there is a corresponding kind of mental state, a mental attitude of anger. And Fisker says that's a mistake and that you can see that's a mistake if you look both at the diversity of uses within a single language community, but also if you look at the differences across different language communities. And I think Fisker is right, and I think we should have the same approach for knowledge, intention, and the rest. There's an easy way that you might miss this, though. So you might think, look, Steve, there's really no problem here, because our mind-reading abilities, or if you like, our folk psychology, as it's sometimes called, involves there being common knowledge of a set of principles which implicitly define intention, knowledge, and the rest. And indeed, back in 1972, one of the pioneers in this area, David Lewis, suggested exactly that. So he suggested that we have common knowledge of principles of the form. When someone is in a combination of mental states and receives certain kind of sensory stimuli, then they will tend with a certain probability to be caused thereby to go into certain mental states and to produce certain motor responses. So Lewis. Now, if you look at people's ordinary talk about mental states, you see that it doesn't look very much like that. It does not look very much like that. So people will tell you all kinds of things, for example, about what their phones are trying to do. And these things do not seem to lend themselves to the sorts of generalization that Lewis has in mind. It looks a bit messy. So it looks like the way that philosophers have seen folk psychology is quite different from the way that it really is. But we shouldn't rely just on a rather sort of casual corpus inquiry to test that principle. Since Lewis wrote this in 1972, we've had 50 years. How much progress have we made in uncovering those principles which are common knowledge and which implicitly define intention, knowledge, and the rest? I think you can see the answer to that question is not a lot. If you reflect that probably the 
best, most systematic and careful work on this topic remains that produced by Haider back in 1958, so actually predating Lewis. What you know if you go and read Haider's book on what he calls common sense psychology is first of all, it doesn't seem like the principles that Haider identifies are anything like rich enough to allow us to characterize mental states like intention, knowledge, and the rest. It actually doesn't seem that folk psychology, as Haider understands it, is particularly concerned with those things. Secondly, it seems far from true that those are common knowledge. And indeed, you notice that Haider backs right away from saying that in his rather careful reflections on his project. And I think for good reason. Thirdly, and this is part of the reason why he backs away from common knowledge, Haider himself, in order to uncover principles which he regards as a matter of systematizing and tidying up things which are in common sense psychology, Haider draws quite heavily on philosophers like Ryle. So it seems to me very unlikely that Lewis is right that folk psychology provides us with common knowledge or involves common knowledge of principles that implicitly define these mental states. If that were true, then there would be no problem in relying on our ordinary expertise as mind readers. I think the confidence that philosophers have that that is true has explained why many of us as researchers, including myself, have been very complacent about the need to anchor our understanding of intention, knowledge, and the rest. But the truth is that we cannot rely on our ordinary personal expertise. But Steve, you will tell me, that's no problem at all, because after all, we have good philosophical accounts of these things. And that's indeed exactly the line that I myself have taken. I thought, look, there are these philosophical accounts and there's no problem there. And of course, philosophers disagree a little bit, but we'll get there eventually. And I think, you know, initially as a younger philosopher, I thought certain philosophers were right and others were clearly wrong. But if you look more carefully at the kind of diversity that we have in philosophical accounts, you see that we do face a deeper problem. Just focus first on the state of intention. So let's have some basic questions here. Is intention a mental state or not? Some philosophers say yes, others say no, or at least lean in that direction. Do you have an intention? Is that just a matter of having a belief about your future actions? Some philosophers say yes, and others say no. If I have an intention, must I also believe that I will do what I intend? If I intend tonight to attend a concert, must I also, as a matter of rationality, believe that I will attend a concert? Some say no, some argue, uh, so, sorry, some say yes, Gilbert Harmon, and many others argue that that's true, others say no. And so it goes on. So what's striking here are two things. One is, we have a load of quite basic questions about the nature of intention. And for almost any question you think, can think to ask, you can f find philosophers who take opposing views of the matter. Secondly, it's not just that the philosophers are being awkward here. Each of them has a well-worked out, internally consistent view of the matter. So it's not that the philosophers are kind of disagreeing on the questions, but there's nothing behind that. Typically, in all of these cases, there is a systematic, careful way of thinking about intention that justifies or entails the pattern of answers that that particular philosopher gives, and that doesn't seem to have any obvious problem with consistency. So we're in this situation where we've got many incompatible theories, and for any theory we have, there'll be others which are only very slightly different from it, which disagree only on a small number of questions, but across all of the theories, we've got this very large range of diversity. And that makes it very difficult both to think, okay, we'll just pick a winner, or to think, well, we'll take several of these theories and test the hypothesis that one or the other of these theories is the right way to think about how ordinary mind readers think about intention. It would just be almost impossible to do that because of the sheer number and density of the theories that we have. It's also important that the philosophical theories involve differences which are extremely hard to operationalize. And so that is also a significant obstacle here. But I don't think the diversity of the philosophical accounts is even the worst problem that we face in trying to anchor our understanding as researchers of 
intention, knowledge, and the rest. We do want to understand what these states are, and we need a shared understanding of that as researchers. We can't, it seems, look to philosophy, because actually, in many cases, what anchors the philosopher's understandings is nothing other than the researcher's ordinary expertise that we have already dismissed. Now this is a somewhat complicated point. So philosophers have different aims. There are philosophers who are attempting to comment on the structure of thinking that's implicit in a particular form of a particular cultural activity. So in legal processes or in ethical domains. So you might be thinking about intentional knowledge in a, a, along a particular dimension. As a philosopher, you might also be making a proposal, not about how anybody does think, but how it would be better if we did think. So a good case of this is Tamar Gendler, who introduced the notion of a leaf. And I once asked her about this and she said, Steve, I'm trying to add something to folk psychology. I'm trying to add a tool to folk psychology that we could use in the future. So in, in those cases, of course, those philosophers, what they're doing may be perfectly sensible and coherent, but it won't help us as researchers to anchor notions like knowledge, intention, and the rest, if what we want is to understand the expertise of ordinary mind readers. But there are other philosophers who quite explicitly are anchoring their understanding in folk psychology. So I think what they're doing is a kind of folk psychological activity. They're doing what you and I are doing in our everyday lives when we, uh, for example, explain why somebody missed an appointment by saying, well, she forgot. Right? She forgot. She didn't turn up to your birthday party because she forgot. Really sorry about that, but totally understandable. Uh, totally understandable. So uh, you can also use folk psychology, not just for talking about these specific cases, but for elaborating quite general ideas, so it turns out. And I think often that's what philosophers are doing. Uh, Nagel is quite explicit about this, Jennifer Nagel, who we'll see again later. So she says, epistemic case intuitions, so the views about particular cases that guide her and others in saying what knowledge is, are generated by folk psychology. So in other words, Nagel is relying on her ordinary everyday expertise as a mind reader in order to generate criteria that she's then using to generalize in thinking about what knowledge is. Uh, and Helen Stewart offers a somewhat similar approach. So she says many things like this. This is just one of them, but I think it's absolutely characteristic. Uh, she wrote this rather brilliant book whose name escapes me, about agency, among other things. And she says things like, some part of us finds it almost impossible not to categorize these animals as agents. And she regards that as a reason to think that they are agents. So what you can see is that Stuart, like Nagel, is using ordinary everyday expertise as a mind reader in order to generate ideas that then guide the development of a philosophical theory. So what that means from our point of view is that appealing to the philosophers doesn't really get us away from the ordinary everyday expertise. The philosophers might give us a more systematic version of it. They might focus on some aspects and leave out others. Few philosophers have thought much about the mental lives of your mobile phone. But the philosophers are not offering us something different from our ordinary everyday expertise. Now, just to be clear here, I want to distinguish what I'm rejecting from what I'm accepting. I think there's no hope for the idea that we can appeal to philosophical accounts to anchor, for us as researchers, a shared understanding of what knowledge, belief, joy, surprise, and the rest are. That just will not work. I do, though, think, and you'll see that we can do this later, that we can misuse some of these philosophical accounts to characterize various models of the mind. So I don't think there's nothing that we can extract from the philosophical accounts. But I think if you thought, look, we already understand the most sophisticated forms of mind reading because we already understand as researchers what intention, knowledge, and the rest are, and we know that because we can appeal to these philosophical accounts, that will not work. That will not work. Steve, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I don't think that's true. Now, I've spent a long time on this, and you might say, look, this is all very silly. We don't want to think about philosophical accounts. We don't want to rely on our everyday expertise. What we want to do is to recognize that we have operationalizations and we can work back from those. So here people usually talk about theory of mind rather than mind reading. What's striking is that a couple of recent surveys of attempts to operationalize theory of mind 
broadly. So not just false belief tasks, but mind reading as it involves a whole variety of mental states. I've pointed out that there are multiple competing attempts to provide operationalizations, and they do not appear to agree even on the fundamentals of structure. So once again, we have an initial problem here, which is that there are many operationalizations to choose from. There's not much to be said about any of them being wrong, but nor is it clear why we should accept one over the other. Worse than that, if we were going to accept an operationalization and work back from it, we would ideally want some kind of statistical guarantee that the operationalization was coherently targeting a single ability. That's what we'd ideally have, and then we'd work back from it. Now, in the case of the false belief task, we know that there are many, many variants on the false belief task, which change factors like, for example, whether the participant is involved in a deceptive act or is merely an observer, and so on. We can change all of those factors. And across all of the tasks, they still seem to be testing for a single underlying capacity. That's very good news. That suggests that we've got a robust operationalization. So we may not know initially what the false belief tasks are testing for, but we can accept that they're testing for something. And then we can try to work back by analyzing the tasks to a view about what those tasks operationalize. When it comes to theory of mind more generally, it seems that we shouldn't have that confidence in the operationalizations. It's just not clear that any of these operationalizations successfully picks out a single underlying capacity, a theory of mind capacity, so that we could work back from the operationalizations to it. Now, again, I don't think that all is lost here. So I don't think this means the operationalizations are no use to us at all. Of course, I don't think that. I think, for example, the Hen Wellman and Liu theory of mind scale is very useful, and I'll come back to that later. That scale has got, undergone impressive validation in a variety of contexts. It's just that it doesn't get us very far in understanding the mental states. So useful, but it's not going to provide an anchor. So I didn't tell you this before, but my talk actually has three parts. The first part you've just seen, I'm trying to argue that we as researchers lack a shared understanding of mental states like intention, knowledge, surprise, desire, and the rest, and that therefore we don't understand the most sophisticated forms of mind reading. But you know, not understanding things is actually what I do for a living. That is literally my day job. So the fact that I don't understand something and I doubt that we have a shared understanding of it is hardly news. In fact, I don't mean to boast, but they recently made me a professor of not understanding things. So I do think I'm quite good at not understanding things. And so of course, you wouldn't be interested in the fact that I don't understand things. That by itself isn't interesting. The cases where it is interesting is where that lack of shared understanding prevents us from making progress in some domain of research, in developmental or comparative psychology, for example. So I want to give you two illustrations where we do have a practical problem. The first is going to concern intention. And here I'm going to go back to some fairly uh, classic work. So I'm going to go back just over 20 years. So here's Scott and colleagues, and they say, infants in the second year of life can understand deceptive intentions. Uh, they're using a violation of expectation paradigm with 18-month-olds. Very interesting piece of research. All right, very good. And then Woodward said, uh, and I, I mentioned Woodward partly because I think she's uh, one of the most subtle and brilliant thinkers about intention, as well as, of course, being the uh, scientist. So she says, infants understand intentions as existing independently of particular concrete actions and as residing within the individual. Each of these is part of what it means to understand intention. Now that kind of surprises me because I don't think of intentions, or I didn't before I read this, as having any particular location. So you have an intention, and I know where your location is, but I don't think of the intention itself as having any other location, right? It's just yours. Um, it's not that the intention is somehow kind of located somewhere in you, right? Or is in any way a part of you, any more than your size or your mass has a location. But I might be wrong, so I'll go with Woodward here on this. Um, and then Woodward says she thinks of intentions as existing independently of particular concrete actions. And again, here I have some kind of slightly uh, technical problems here to do with the thought that we might think of events and states like intention as 
individuated by their causes and effects. So that the, the particular intention that you have now, it's not true that that intention might have been caused in a way other than it is, although you might have had an intention of the same type uh, as caused in that way. So I'm a little bit confused here, but I, you know, I'm not too worried here. I'm just gonna go with this. I'm just gonna go with the flow because Woodward said, each of these things is part of what it means to understand intention. So here's my real problem. It's not that I think Woodward is wrong. Who am I to say that she is wrong about what it is to understand intention? The problem is that when I look at the Scott et al paper, it doesn't seem to have any relevance to the issue of whether intentions reside within an individual or exist independently of particular concrete actions. So now I don't know what to make of the two things. I don't know how to put them together. Is it that Scott and colleagues are working with a different notion of intention from Woodward's? Is it that they're working with the same notion of intention, but Scott and colleagues don't think it's necessary to uh, test for this part of the understanding? They're just taking that from granted? Or is it that they are working with the same notion of intention, but they've got different views about what it would be to understand intention? So they would disagree on these criteria. I don't know, and I don't know how to solve that question. So I'm finding the lack of a shared understanding of an intention here a bit of a problem. But things get even worse if I go across to the other side, because as in many areas, there's a sort of disagreement between those who think that infants have relatively rich everyday mind-reading expertise, more adult-like expertise, and others like Moses, who are no less subtle in their thinking, no less careful in thinking about the nature of intention and what that tells us about development, but take quite a different view here. So Moses takes the view that an unfulfilled intention must be accompanied by a false belief. And I mean, that kind of surprised me initially because I'd always thought, you know, you can just be unlucky, right? So I intend to go to that concert tonight, uh, but I missed the train and I, I never make it. So the intention's unfulfilled. But Moses says, no, no, Steve, there will have been a false belief somewhere in your background. You will have had a false belief, for example, about what time the train departed or how, it would, how you would get to the train. But why does Moses say this? And there's a really interesting thought here. He says, look, uh, intention has to be different from desire, right? There's something different about desire. Your desires, it's okay, you can have multiple desires independently of your belief. So I might desire that if I press a button here, um, that I would just be showered in chocolate perfectly coherent for me to desire that. But says Moses, you cannot intend to press a button and thereby be showered by chocolate if your beliefs are incompatible with that. Because what distinguishes intentions from desires and the rest is that intentions must be consistent with beliefs. Now I like the reasoning here because I think this makes perfect sense. If we're gonna talk about two things, not one, intentions and desires, then there ought to be a reason why intentions differ from desires and what Moses is saying makes perfect sense. But as he notes, it has the consequence that children from three and younger are unlikely to have differentiated their concept of intention from their concept of desire. All right, so I read Moses and I go along with this, right? I mean, I didn't start thinking this was true, but there is something to it. There is something to it. I can't say that it's right, um, but I certainly don't think there's any reason to reject it. But now I have a real problem. How am I gonna put together Woodward and Moses? How am I going to put together these two researchers? Should I say that Woodward and Moses are offering distinct incompatible notions of intention? So they're really just talking about different things and the dispute between them is merely terminological. Should I instead think that they are talking about a single notion of intention but they've got incompatible views about it? So the distinction between them is really about the uh, really a matter of substance? Or should I alternatively think that they've got the same notion of intention and they actually have compatible views about what intention is? They just differ on what it is to understand intention. So my problem here isn't that we've got f researchers saying different things that are hard to put together. It's that I don't even know whether we should regard these things as two contradictory claims about one thing or as compatible claims about different things. So the appearance of disagreement is merely terminological. And that's a sign to me that the lack of a shared understanding is really a barrier to making progress in research. I think this is a practical problem for interpreting discoveries about 
development. And that if we did have a shared understanding as researchers of intention, we wouldn't face quite that problem. There should still be interesting disagreements, but there should be ways to resolve them in the ordinary way by testing the predictions of hypotheses. Now, talking about intention, I'm talking about one of the most geeky areas of theory of mind. So I find the intention stuff deeply fascinating, but the rather small number of papers that are published in that area, relatively few studies, and the relatively low profile they have, tell me that it's not something that's of wide interest. On the other hand, recently, following some earlier work by Jennifer Nagel and more recent work by Phillips and colleagues, we have had a lot of interest in mind reading as it concerns knowledge. And I think this is an excellent thing. I'm very grateful to these researchers for uh, raising this very interesting hypothesis. So I'm going to focus on Phillips et al, but I do note that, that Nagel offered this hypothesis sometime earlier. And the hypothesis is that you can represent knowledge even if you're unable to represent belief. So this is uh, what's sometimes called the knowledge first view. Opponents think that in order to represent knowledge, you have to represent belief because to know something is among other things to believe it, to believe it and to do some other stuff, right? Um, and they further think, and I don't think this follows directly, but they further think that if you're gonna represent knowledge, then you're already thereby representing belief. And so your capacity to represent knowledge is something more sophisticated than your capacity to represent belief. This hypothesis is opposing that view. This hypothesis says, no, 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 knowledge is the more basic thing. You can represent knowledge even if you're unable to represent belief. Now, the evidence in support of this hypothesis, an interesting and quite broad array from developmental comparative, uh, also differences in cognitive styles, is all about the ability to track knowledge. So what Phillips and colleagues observe is that there are many cases where we have individuals who are capable of tracking knowledge, but not tracking belief. Now, what I want to note here at the outset is something that's sometimes missed. <laughs> If we're just talking about tracking, we do not actually need a shared understanding. All we need to agree is that in this situation, there is knowledge, and in that situation, knowledge is gone. So let's say that you think of knowledge as a mental state. And in fact, you follow David Vellerman, so you think that an intent, uh, sorry, David Vellerman, I'm confusing intention and knowledge. Let's say that you think about knowledge as a mental state, um, and that you also follow people like Nagel and Williamson in thinking of knowledge as a factive mental state somehow anchors you to the facts. Now, I don't share that view at all, let's say. Um, either I don't think of knowledge as a mental state at all, or maybe I'm one of these people who thinks that knowledge is merely true belief, right? I'm following some ancient philosopher in, in trying to hold on to that view. However that may be, you and I will both agree on tracking. Right. What tracking requires is just this. Here's Maxi, and Maxi has a good old look inside the box and sees the chocolate. Maxi knows. You say yes, I say yes. Completely different views about knowledge, really very little shared between us, but we can agree about that. Here's a different situation. Maxi doesn't get to see in the box, nor does anybody tell Maxi anything, nor does Maxi have any way of reasoning about what's in the box. Maxi is ignorant concerning what's in the box. I agree with that, you agree with that. We could have entirely different notions. So here's the thought. When it comes to tracking, we do not need hardly anything in the way of shared understanding to agree about the facts. We might be talking about almost entirely different things, but we would agree that in one case there is knowledge and the other case there is ignorance about those specific cases. When it comes to representation, of course, you'll see that we do need that shared understanding. Now, what's interesting about Phillips and colleagues is that they are fully aware of the large diversity of views about knowledge that they face. And they, I think rightly, do not wish to pin themselves to a particular view about the nature of knowledge. They regard that as fatal. And I think that's fair enough. You know, last two and a half thousand years haven't shown any signs of convergence in people's views about the nature of knowledge when they've thought about it philosophically. Uh, so it's probably a mistake to wait or hope that we're gonna achieve convergence in the near future if we wanna get on and do some experiments. So they have what I think is a nice approach in principle. They say, look, here are four features which are specific to knowledge and which everybody agrees on. So they say it's factive, knowledge is not just true belief, knowledge allows for egocentric ignorance. That's to say, 
I can recognize that you know something which I do not. So that from my point of view, that's egocentric ignorance. I'm ignorant, you're knowledgeable, and I recognize it. And knowledge is not modality specific. That's to say that <clears throat> because you know what's in the box, it doesn't follow that you have seen what's in the box. You might also have been able to smell it or you might have heard somebody tell you about it. So knowledge is not modality specific. Now, if we wanted to quibble here, we could note, for example, on the second factor, there is actually significant room for disagreement. It's quite plausible to think of knowledge as just true belief if you add some further views about the nature of belief. And that's something, uh, sort of a position that's been developed at some length. But let's put that aside. The more interesting response that you will see in the commentary to Phillips, which comes up again and again, is that these four features are not specific to knowledge, for there are other things, perhaps more primitive, than most people think knowledge to be, which are also characterized by these four features. So Duradev and Krupnik talk about epistemic contract, contact, contact. Schlicht and colleagues mention uh, three things. Here's two, uh, know-how and perceptual access. So perceptual access has all of these features. Uh, Starman's, I thought this was quite brilliant, uh, points out that not being ignorant is normally thought of as something different from knowing, but also has all of these features. And with Ian Appley in the construction of minimal theory of mind, we demonstrated how to construct very primitive notions, which also have all of these four features. So the no notion of encountering, for example, has all of those four features. So I think this response is absolutely right. These four features are not in fact specific to knowledge, and it's relatively easy to construct a wide variety of mental states that also have these four features. It's something that, that can quite easily be done. There are many alternatives here. All right, but why does that matter? Maybe that doesn't matter at all, right? So maybe we shouldn't worry too much about any of these things. Well, I think that does matter because their hypothesis is that you can represent knowledge if you're even unable to represent belief. And the evidence, as I said before, is that you can track differences in knowledge. The problem that their openness to knowledge creates is that somebody can respond in the way that Schlicht and colleagues did by saying that the evidence about tracking is explainable in terms of not representing knowledge, but rather in representing facts that explain why somebody acts. And I think that their strategy is right. And in fact, if you look at the replies, you'll see that Starman's also has a version of their strategy. Here's the thing. There are a variety of states that have the four features that they regard as specific to knowledge. For any of those states, not being ignorant, uh, this fact type of knowledge, uh, sorry, this fact type, uh, action explaining facts, the notion of encountering from Appley and Butterfield's minimal theory of mind, for any of those things, we can construct the hypothesis that what subjects are representing is that thing rather than knowledge. And the evidence concerning tracking will support that hypothesis just as well as it will support the Phillips et al. hypothesis. So it's unclear that the evidence provides justification for the hypothesis that they have. But my problem with that isn't that Phillips et al. here are wrong, right? I, I actually kind of hope that there's a sense in which they're right, and I think we will eventually get there. So my problem isn't that they're wrong. My problem is that I don't think we even have a good anchor for this debate. I think the debate is being framed in a way that suppose that you and I as researchers have a shared understanding of knowledge and we do not. And to see why that is, let me go back to Schlicht et al's objection. So they say, look, we can imagine that the agents explain behaviors by citing facts about the world. If they were doing that, they would give every appearance of tracking knowledge in the experimental research that Nagel and Phillips et al are interested in, but they wouldn't thereby be representing knowledge. But here's the problem. Are we sure that if Schlicht et al are right, these people are then not really representing knowledge? According to the philosopher John Hyman, personal propositional knowledge is the ability to act and refrain from acting for reasons that are facts. So here's the tricky thing. On a view like Hyman's, it's far from clear 
that what Schlicht et al's objection amounts to is a failure to represent knowledge, because in representing those action-explaining facts, it looks very much like you might be representing knowledge. So my problem isn't that I think we've got good objections to Phillips et al. I do think we've got good objections, and if you look at the Phillips et al replies, I think you'll see they haven't answered many of the objections uh, very fully, right? I very much like the work, which is why I'm talking about it, but I don't think they're giving us really excellent replies to the objections. So I do think that there are some objections that appear to hold. But the deeper problem that we face is that it's very unclear whether or not what appears to be an objection is actually an objection, because it's very unclear what we all should be talking about when we're talking about knowledge. That's to say that our shared understanding of knowledge as researchers is lacking, and that prevents us with a practical problem for interpreting these developmental and comparative discoveries. We basically cannot formulate the hypothesis in the way that Nagel or Phillips et al. do, unless we have some clear way of anchoring our understanding of knowledge, and a way of anchoring it that provides a link to the evidence they use. So I've been suggesting that this is a practical problem. But of course, that by itself wouldn't be particularly interesting. What we really need to know is, how should we change our approach to the study of mind reading? And I don't think, I did think, but I don't think this is true, I don't think we can undertake, achieve a shared understanding of these states. I don't think we can achieve a shared understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about intention, knowledge, and the rest. Or more carefully, I think that if we did achieve a shared understanding, we would be then rejecting the idea that there is any such thing as knowledge or intention or the rest, that there are such states, and we would have no use for them. So we would have to work around the problem that we lack a shared understanding anyway. So in order to make progress here, in order to work around our lack of a shared understanding of intention, knowledge, and the rest, I think we can do two things. We need a characterization of mental states generally, and then we need a characterization of particular attitudes. And it turns out, helpfully, that these two projects are to a large degree independent of each other. We can, or there are approaches on which they're independent of each other. And that's helpful because it simplifies the problem. So I want to start by characterizing mental states generally, and then switch to the characterization of particular attitudes afterwards. And for this purpose, I'm going to start with a brilliant book by Perna from 1991. So this book now is more than 30 years old, but when I was preparing this research, I went back and had another pass through that book, and I was once again blown away by how brilliant it is. You know, if there's one book that you were going to read on mind reading, even after all these years, it probably is uh, Perna's Understanding the Representational Mind. Now, one thing that's particularly brilliant about this book is that Perna starts with a theory about the nature of mental states, which doesn't involve any common sense notions that rely on your expertise as mind readers. So Perna adopts what to many of us will be a kind of an idea that's familiar from Fodor, the philosopher Jerry Fodor. He says representation involves a representational medium that stands in a representing relation to its representational content. So what's particularly important about this view is that for Perna, there's a representation relation, which is a relation to some representational content. Now, so far, it's reasonable to think that we have a shared understanding of what Perna's talking about here, because he's using an entirely technical vocabulary. He then offers us a conjecture which provides a link to the most sophisticated forms of mind reading. So he thinks, for example, that what we might call the diverse desire task, I desire one thing and you desire another thing, and the two things are not incompatible, that they're just different. And if you're able to recognize that and make predictions about my actions, although my desires differ from yours, then you've passed the diverse desire task. So Perna says, look, in order to pass that, you would have to have an understanding of a representational relation, but it would only have to relate you to situations. It would only have to relate you to aspects of the world as it actually is. But, says Perna, when it comes to a false belief task, 
uh, so you know that the chocolate's in the cupboard, but I believe falsely that the chocolate is over here on the shelf. Where will I go when I want to look for the chocolate? Although you have a belief that would justify going to the box, to pass the false belief task, you predict that I will go to the shelf. Well done, you've passed the false belief task. Now, Perna says, in order to pass the false belief task, we need to understand a representation, the thing that I represent, the location of the chocolate. But the thing about this is that we can't regard the representational relation as a relation to a situation, because there is no aspect of the world. What I believe is something that is not. Right? I believe what is not, namely that chocolate is on the shelf, but it isn't. So there's no situation that I could be related to in Perna's sense of situation here. There's no fact that I could be related to. So in the false belief case, the representational relation has to be understood as a, represent, as a relation to a representation. It's a relation that relates me, or representation in me, to a representation of how the world could be, the chocolate being on the shelf. So this is Perna's analysis. Now I think there are two things that are important about this. Sorry, I've, I've explained it in too much detail, and in a way the details don't matter. Two things are important. One is, Perna has a clear separation between the language and postulates of the researcher, these are representation and representational relations, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the notions of the mind reader. So the mind reader herself might use like terms like desire, belief, and whatever, but they, may, they play no role in Perna's theory. We're not using those as having any kind of particular theoretical weight. If it turned out that there was no such thing as desire, Perna's theory works just as well. The second thing that I think is important, and is a consistent theme in decades of Perna's research, is that the link between the theory about the nature of mental states and the mind reading abilities is a conjecture. So Perna's very clear about this. We have a theory about the nature of the mental. It's then a conjecture that this theory gives us insight into how mind readers interact with each other in everyday life. I think too often, especially among philosophers, there's a quick jump from conviction in a theory about this is the nature of the mental to a conclusion about this is how the mind readers must be. Oh, you know, I'm convinced that knowledge is somehow a factive mental state. The knowledge essentially involves relation to the facts, and so it couldn't be something like a belief where you could have a false belief. Knowledge must be a different kind of state. I'm convinced about that, and somehow that gives me greater confidence that that's also how the mind readers themselves must understand knowledge, whatever that understanding amounts to. And it seems to me that we ought to regard that second step as a conjecture, and that's exactly what we see in Perna. So we've got two things which are virtues. Separation between the shared understanding that we have as researchers, the, frame, the representational framework, and the point of view of the mind reader, belief, desire, and the rest. And we've also got a conjecture linking the two. And importantly, of course, conject uh, Perna's conjecture generates predictions. So it's not a, a, a kind of idle conjecture here, but it's a conjecture that generates predictions that Perna has himself systematically tested over the last decades with relatively impressive results. Now, although I have a lot of respect for Perna's theory, I'm here today to tell you that I think we ought to consider an alternative. I think one of the things that we have failed in theory of mind research to do is to develop alternative conjectures about how mental states are from the point of view of mind readers. In the literature, there is only really, as far as I know, Perna's proposal about the Fodorian notion of representation. So it would be kind of good to have an alternative. And if I were reaching for an alternative, I would go to one of my favourite philosophers, uh, Donald Davidson, who thinks that beliefs represent nothing. So this is about as far away from Fodor and Perna's position as you can get. But before I tell you anything about what this alternative is, what conjectures it might lead us to postulate, and what predictions those conjectures might generate. I want to give you a kind of informal motivation for considering the alternative. And I'll call this Perna's paradox. So this is not meant to be super serious, it's just meant to motivate us in considering that it might be worth testing alternatives to Perna's theory. Uh, and this paradox is inspired by 
a rather lovely film called The Invention of Lying, which is a takeoff of an ancient view in philosophy uh, on which it was just impossible to have a false belief. And it was also impossible to say something false. Uh, and what's marvellous about the film The Invention of Lying is that, you know, it's, it's, it's well over 2,000 years out of date. Uh, it's a takeoff of a philosophical view that hasn't been current for a very long time. Uh, but it goes to show, you know, philosophy has enduring value. Uh, so that's good. Anyway, uh, the paradox goes like this. Ancient philosophers, I'm saying, were deeply puzzled about the possibility of speaking and thinking falsely. And in fact, some of them, it's a really brilliant lesson in how philosophers think. Some of them were so convinced that there was a problem that they thought that you couldn't speak falsely or couldn't believe falsely. But not as in the film, uh, that somehow they therefore thought that everybody was entirely truthful. Of course, they thought that all of the, what we ordinarily think of as deceit was a matter not of speaking or thinking of falsely, but of something else, right? So it was still, there's still plenty of bad stuff going on. They were well aware of that. Um, I also think it's very likely that many of the ancient philosophers could have passed false belief tasks, just like many contemporary philosophers could have. The ancients and the contemporaries are probably not that different with respect to the false belief task, which has proven itself extremely robust across different cultures and groups. Not that everybody ultimately passes it, but most people in adult do. And I don't think we've got reason to think the ancient philosophers were terribly different. To pass a false belief task, I suppose, is to understand a case of misrepresentation. This at least is a commitment that Perna makes explicitly. And finally, on Perna's view, this is the theory, explicit understanding of representation is necessary for understanding cases of misrepresentation, where you notice that to explicitly understand representation is to model the representational relationship to a representation. Why is this a paradox? Well, we've got reason to accept all the claims, but they can't all be true. So these two claims are motivated by Perna's theory for which there is some evidence. But if the ancients pass false belief tasks, then they do understand a case of misrepresentation. So using for, it follows that they mentally model the representational relationship. But the thing about that is that this is precisely what you need in order not to be puzzled about false belief. The reason why Perna and the other philosophers think that the representational relationship is a relation to a representation is because they want to model the possibility of false belief. It can't be a, represent a relation to an aspect of the world in the case of false belief, because there is no aspect of the world to relate to. So they think it must be a relation to a representation. And that would seem to mean that the ancients couldn't have been deeply puzzled about the possibility of thinking falsely or speaking falsely, because they had already, on Perna's theory, all of the equipment that they needed. They had an explicit understanding here. Now, I don't think that Perna's paradox should motivate us to reject Perna's view, not at all, right? So all I think is that it should motivate us to think about alternatives, derive hypotheses from them, generate predictions and test those predictions against Perna's. So what would the alternative view look like if we followed Davidson's measurement theoretic model? Well, essentially the idea would be this. When you have a belief and I want to talk about your belief, I might say something like, uh, you believe that the chocolate is over here. That's what you believe. And on Davidson's view, the use of that utterance of mine is something like the use of a number in order to distinguish one temperature from another. Importantly, the number plays no physical role. So you don't think as temperature is somehow a relation to a number. Right? And you don't think that when you're talking about the temperature by saying the soup is at 40 degrees, so it needs to be a bit warmer, Steve, the soup is at 40 degrees, you don't think that you're describing something that the soup stands in a relation to, 40, or 40 ness or something like that. Not at all. Similarly, says Davidson, the sentences, the utterances play no psychological role. So the utterance that I make, uh, the chocolate is over here when I'm describing your belief, isn't something that you're somehow related to, nor does it pick out a proposition or a representation that you're related to. I'm not saying anything about what you're related to at all on a view like Davidson's. Now this brief presentation, I haven't done a good job of making this view coherent, but what I can tell you is that uh, Bob Matthews has written an entire book 
explaining this theory and its consequences. So I think it's a reasonable bet that this is a internally coherent position. It doesn't involve any kind of you know, inconsistency or problem. And that's not to say that the theory is correct, but that's not our concern. Our concern is to distinguish two hypotheses. Perna's hypothesis that the most sophisticated forms of mind reading involve a representational understanding, and what we might call the alternative hypothesis, which is that they involve a measurement theoretic understanding. Now, of course, things could be more complicated because it may be that both kinds of understanding are involved in different mind reading abilities or different aspects of mind reading abilities or that people switch between the two. But if we wanted a simple playoff between the two hypotheses as a way of getting started, it's important that both generate contrasting predictions. Uh, so Perna's paradox is the non-serious problem for Perna's uh, work, but Perna himself pointed out uh, with, in research with uh, Leakham and others from his group at the time, that if his theory is right, then it would follow that performance on a false belief task would be correlated with performance on a false sign task, because both cases, on Perna's view, involve a representational medium. By contrast, if we took a measurement theoretic view, we wouldn't think that false belief involved any kind of representational medium. So the grounds for linking false signs to false beliefs are rather thin, and therefore the prediction that those performance on those two things should be correlated is very hard to generate on the alternative theory. Uh, so it looks like the view that the hypothesis that Perna offers is ahead on that front. Uh, and, and there are other hypotheses as well that go different ways. My point here isn't to convince you that we can already do a full-scale evaluation. What I think would be exciting and informative would be to consider the two alternatives head to head. For the last 30 years, Perna's theory has about the nature of the mental, as the mind readers understand it, has been a very lonely theory. Perna's theory has been tested as the only hypothesis under consideration. It would be much better to have a contrasting hypothesis. I'm offering the measurement theoretic hypothesis as an alternative, but maybe there are others that could be tested against it. That would give us a deeper understanding of the nature of mind reading. So here's my very simple thought. We do like a shared understanding of the nature of intention, knowledge and the rest in our lives as researchers, but we can work around that problem. And the way to work around it is by building on Perna strategy and specifying more than one theory about the nature of mental states. But of course, in doing that, it hasn't taken us very far because one of the things we want to know in theory of mind research is about the understanding of specific attitudes, knowledge versus belief, intention versus desire, surprise versus the mere violation of an expectation, and so on and so forth. We want to understand all of these different attitudes. And when we're thinking about theories of mental states generally, we don't have any distinction between the attitudes. So what we've done so far is to think about ways of characterizing mental states generally. The additional thing we need is to think about how you would characterize particular attitudes. Now one possibility here would be to appeal to decision theory. Why might we appeal to decision theory? Well, the thing about decision theory is that it's a formalization that provides us with a clear understanding of two notions which function very much like mental states, subjective probabilities and preferences. Now we don't have to think about these as mental states. We can be uh, entirely agnostic concerning their nature, um, but they provide us with things that play many of the roles that we want mental states to play in mind reading. The other thing we know from the history of attempts to construct decision theory is that people struggled for a while to understand how we could simultaneously characterize both the subjective probability and the preferences just in terms of one variable or set of observations, the choices that people made. Right? How could we get two different parameters back from the choices? And the ultimate success in providing axioms that did allow us to do that was preceded by some much simpler models where instead of thinking of preferences as specific to 
an individual, it was thought instead that it was just a matter of how good or bad different things were. That wasn't a person-specific thing. There was just this objective thing that we all had to uh, align ourselves to, the objective values. And we could alternatively have done the same thing with facts. So we could have allowed preferences to vary between the people, but supposed there was no difference in subjective probabilities. The probabilities were just what they were, and our actions responded to those. And in fact, we can also have kind of decision theory, which involves neither of those things. Why is this interesting? Well, on this side, we've got notions that we clearly have a shared understanding of. We've got notions that we clearly have a shared understanding of. Of course, there are different varieties of decision theory. There's unexpected utility theory and the rest. And of course, there are interesting theoretical questions about what we might do with the model that decision theory uh, uh, provides us with, right? So what would be the relation between decision theory and some kind of normative claim? But as long as we think of this as purely a model, a characterization of some aspect of ways the world could be, we don't have to worry about any of those debates. There isn't really anything here that we do not have a shared understanding of as researchers. Secondly, it's useful because we can link a hypothesis about mind reading to different tasks in the Wellman and Liu theory of mind scale. So for example, they have a diverse desire task. I say to you, uh, do you prefer to eat this lovely chocolate over here or this lovely broccoli over here? And you say, oh, Steve, I prefer the broccoli. And I say, oh, do you know what? I prefer the chocolate. Now it's my turn. Am I going to go for the broccoli or am I going to go for the chocolate? And if you can say, Steve, you're going to go for the chocolate, you've passed the diverse desire task because you've made a prediction about my action, even though if I had your desire, it would be different. Now, if we wanted to compare the hypothesis that the first model characterized your mind reading with the hypothesis that the second model characterized your mind reading, success on the diverse desires task would seem to suggest that you were indeed better modeled by this second thing than by the first one. What's important here is that we're using desire to characterize the language of the mind reader. Although of course very few people actually speak explicitly in terms of desire, they'll tell you that they want chocolate. Um, we're not using that on this side. We've got a technical notion that we have a perfect shared understanding of. So if we think about the diverse desires task in this way, as allowing us to decide between these two hypotheses about the model that underpins your expertise, we don't need any shared understanding of the notion of desire. Same thing when it comes to the diverse belief tasks. So I think the chocolate's over here, you think it's over there. In this situation, we, we don't know where the chocolate actually is, we've got no idea, so it's a diverse belief task rather than a false belief task. And um, then I ask, you know, where do you think I'm gonna go when I want the chocolate? And although you think it's over here, my bet is that it's over there. So you ought to predict that I go over here. And if you do, you've passed this task. And we could model that by saying, we've got two hypotheses about the kind of underlying model that underpins your mind reading. Your success on the diverse device task favors this second hypothesis, decision theory minus desire, over the fact-based decision theory. And again, the important thing is that we don't need any understanding of belief at all to do this, other than the thought that we can link that operationalization to this task. We don't really need beyond that any shared understanding at all. So as in the case of Perna, there is a way of approaching attitudes that allows us to distinguish clearly the postulates of the researcher that we have to have shared among us from the language of the targets of research. I think this, I believe that, I desire that. We don't even have to think that those are states, which I think is important. And then there's a final question. So suppose we wanted to distinguish the hypothesis that you had any of these three models, and perhaps you could switch between these two models, from the hypothesis that you had the full-blown model. Now in this case, it wouldn't be enough to pass both diverse desires and diverse beliefs because you might just be switching between two partially facts-based models. So a task like the Wellman and Liu belief emotion allows us to separate this. So I think this is good progress. We can map a range of tasks from Wellman and Liu's theory of mind scale onto a set of hypotheses that we formulate using the 
notions that we take from a form of decision theory. And interestingly and helpfully, this decision theory stuff is completely neutral on the nature of the underlying states. So it's compatible with Perna's view, it's compatible with the measurement theoretic alternative of the matter, and it's also compatible with a range of different views on which these are not any kind of mental state at all. So we've got the possibility of approaching mind reading by thinking about two orthogonal dimensions. So I'm suggesting that we can work around the fact that we lack a shared understanding of intention, knowledge and the rest, because actually we can use a variety of formal tools to explain what it is that various theory of mind tasks operationalize without talking about intention, knowledge and the rest at all. But you're probably already thinking, look, Steve, this is incredibly limited. And you can see it's incredibly limited if you take a look at the uh, knowledge ignorance task, which is also part of the same basic theory of mind scale that Wellman and Liu proposed. So I'm going on about this scale because I think it's one of the best developed tools that's been quite widely used but it's also supposed to capture fairly basic forms of theory of mind, right? So it's supposed to capture something like the, the developmental beginnings of theory of mind, not the full sophistication. So the fact that when we get still within the theory of mind scale, our formal model doesn't really allow us to distinguish even all the tasks in there. This is like really bad news, given that the objective is to understand the most sophisticated forms of mind reading. Uh, so they have a knowledge ignorance task. Knowledge ignorance task, you're told, Polly has never seen inside this drawer. So does Polly know what's inside the drawer? And if you say no, you've passed that knowledge ignorance task. But there's no way for us to characterize that mind reading success by reference to the decision theoretic framework. Right? We've just, we just run out of road here. We've just run out of road. And famously, I mean, this is, you know, it's entirely uncontroversial that the decision theoretic framework just doesn't capture very much of the things that we're interested in, in theory of mind. There's no scope for thinking about emotion, mood, humor, or uh, what we'll come to in a moment, time. Uh, the factor about time, the fact that you're performing multiple actions at different times and may therefore need to coordinate your actions across time to plan your actions. So what, what can we do here? Um, so I had a look at some attempts to give formal accounts of knowledge. And what I was struck by is that attempts to provide formal models of knowledge seem to run aground very quickly if what we want is a notion of knowledge that's potentially explanatory of behavior. As Stornicker explains in two chapters of this book, when you try to get around the problem of logical omniscience. So when you try to get around the problem that you encounter of modeling knowledge that on all the best models that we have, people know absolutely all of the logical entailments of anything that they know, which makes them not very useful for understanding why someone might act in the way that they do. You run into a variety of extremely difficult problems that are uh, notoriously difficult to solve and I think it's fair to say that we don't have the first idea how to solve them. So this isn't to say that you can't come up with ways of representing knowledge formally but the advantage of decision theory where you really characterize some notions, you introduce a new characterization of notions that you didn't understand before, that's something that we probably can't hope for from the formal models. So what I think we might do instead is try to exploit facts about the limits of the formal models that we already have in order to characterize what we're operationalizing when we're operationalizing theory of mind tasks. And for this purpose, I wanted to go with a relatively ambitious task. You see, most of the theory of mind tasks which are supposedly linked to intention do not in fact take us beyond the decision theoretic framework. But there are clearly uh, if we were talking loosely about the notion of intention and tracking intentions, there are clearly tasks that we would want to have that do take us beyond there. Uh, so this is something which I think I've stolen from Sabina Hunis and colleagues, although I'm afraid I have to admit I couldn't find the paper in time for this talk, uh, and I'm not even sure uh, whether or not she, she finally published it. So we did correspond about this a while ago. I think there's some fantastically interesting uh, work which inspired this. Uh, 
but for some reason the work didn't get published. In any case, I merely want to steal her theoretical idea here. Sabina Hunis. So this is your supermarket, and this is the entrance to your supermarket. And uh, because of the COVID, the supermarket has introduced a one-way system. Uh, so if you enter the supermarket here, you can either turn left and then your fate's decided, or you can go ahead and then your fate's decided, and there's no way back. It's a one-way system, and you're not going to break the uh, regulation here at all. Over here are some bananas. Now, you quite like some bananas, and you definitely want to buy bananas on this trip to the supermarket. Over here is the chocolate. You absolutely love the chocolate. The chocolate is your top priority. You will not leave the supermarket without that, no matter the cost. Now, if we're thinking about this in terms of decision theory, there are two ways to frame it. We can frame it in terms of what's your immediate action. So you have a choice between getting the bananas or getting the chocolate. Since you have a strong preference for the chocolate over the bananas and all the other factors are equal, you're definitely going to go for the chocolate. But if you do that, you're going to leave the supermarket with just chocolate, which is not exactly an optimal life outcome. There is another way of framing it, which is you could either go just for the chocolate, just for the bananas, or both of them. So here we're using a larger temporal frame in order to decide what actions you're choosing between. And if we think of you as choosing between these actions, then of course what you're going to do is take the longer route, get the bananas, and zip down and get the chocolate. Very straightforward. Now what's striking is that our basic form of decision theory here has nothing at all to say about the rationality of framing it one way or framing it the other way. It has nothing at all to say about that. Uh, and it turns out to be quite difficult to say anything about this in terms of a, uh, a model or explicitly. But my suggestion here is that we don't actually need a more elaborate model. So we can point out that there is a limit of the model that we have, the decision theoretic model, it doesn't allow us to distinguish between a better and a worse way of framing matters. We can point out that for ordinary mind readers, it probably is the case that there are better and worse ways of framing it. And we can then use their predictions about what I will do when I enter the supermarket to work out whether or not they're able to see this problem of the rationality of different temporal frames, right? coordinating different temporal frames. So if people reliably predict that I will go for the bananas and then the chocolate when I enter my supermarket, even though I really, really want to minimize the length of the route I take, I'm sorry, I should have said that earlier, uh, I'm, I have a very strong preference for minimizing the time I'm in the supermarket and therefore the distance that I travel. That's very, very important to me. Although that doesn't trump my desire for bananas, which is a bit stronger than that. Um, so given that third constraint, if people can reliably predict that I won't go straight for the chocolate and leave it without any bananas, but rather will always go for first the bananas and then the chocolate, even though I much prefer chocolate to bananas, and if people will make the same prediction once the one-way system is taken away, and that they're, if their predictions are independent of the various distances involved and so on, then we can be clear that they have understood something that we might very informally call, in our previous way of thinking, intention. And the important thing is that an understanding of intention, or one aspect of it if you like, one thing that you know we might have called intention, can be characterized in terms of the limits of the formal model. The limit in this case being the problem of coordinating different temporal frames. So my thought here is that even without a formal model, we have a good way of separating postulates of researchers from the language of the targets. So you might have the targets, we might informally say, I want the chocolate more than the bananas, but I intend to get both. And then you might say, Steve, ooh, well, you know, do we go with Woodward or Moses with intention, or is there some other view? And the truth is that we don't need to know, we don't need to decide that, because we can think about the problem here as a matter of coordinating frames specifying different temporal perspectives. And we understand that by reference to the limits of the decision theoretic model that we started with. So what I'm suggesting is that we can go beyond the limits of our admittedly very limited formal models by specifying which limits an operationalization tests. And that provides us also with a good shared understanding of theory of mind.
So although I think there might be a lot more to do here, there are ways in which we can work around our lack of a shared understanding of mental states like intention, knowledge, desire, and the rest. It's not at all essential for us to make progress in theory of mind that we do have such an understanding, as long as we're prepared to make some changes to the way that we explain what theory of mind is. So here's my thought in conclusion. It's not just that we lack a shared understanding. I don't think we could ever have a shared understanding because I don't think there are things, knowledge, intention, and the rest. Nor do I think that we should aim for a shared understanding. I think we should recognize that there are multiple coherent ways to model minds and actions, and we should design theory of mind tasks that work around that. There is no research in any other domain, physical cognition, number cognition, any other kind of cognition, color cognition even, where the research succeeds by unreflectively using the language of the targets of explanation in characterizing the tasks or the cognitive processes. It's only mind reading where we were tempted to do that. But that is something that you and I can change.